of fishing that we are showcasing. They've also generously donated two $75 gift certificates, a stripping basket and a large saltwater fly wallet to keep your flies handy. As a bonus, Graham Day, our final speaker in the series, has donated a guided day on the water and more details will be available during his webinar on the 24th, the last of the series. First, a little housekeeping. This is a webinar, not a regular Zoom meeting. I'm sure many of you will have questions and you can type these via the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen. And there'll be plenty of time at the end for all the questions. If you're new to Zoom, at the top right is a button that can change your view. We recommend gallery view. You can also adjust the side to side size of the presentation with your cursor. One last item before we get to the show. If you go to the council website listed on the screen and click the donation button for $5 or more, you'll be entered in a drawing to win a bunch of swag. The drawing will be held on Facebook Live on April the 28th at 6 p.m. It's April 28th at 6 p.m. Winners need not be present to win and you'll be notified by email. All net proceeds are going to the Southwest Council Youth Program. A very, very worthy cause. Okay, so let's get to our speaker today. Michelle Bowman is a mom, a marine biologist, an accomplished surfer, and a stand-up paddleboard angler. She's recently moved into the medical device world, but continues to fish as often as family life and work time will allow. She began fishing in 2004 when she met her now husband, Conway Bowman. After fishing from their boat and from the sandy shores near the home in Encinitas, California, she combined her two passions for fishing and surfing and started board fishing in the local San Diego kelp beds. These days, she spends a bit more time with Conway and her two young boys, Max and Jackson, fishing on their boat or in the Eastern Sierra looking for trout, but she hopes to get them all out on paddle boards with rods this summer. So let's give a warm welcome to Michelle. All right, thank you very much, Marshall. I appreciate the introduction and I'm honored to be here. Um, super quick, I think Conway's presentation is on the 10th, uh, next Saturday, not the 19th, if I'm correct. Oh, that's correct. I, I, mis I misread my own text. That is, he's next Lovely. Saturday. That's Thank okay. Luckily, yeah, I'm, I'm the holder of the, the calendar in the family, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Thanks, next Saturday, you're correct. Thank you. Yeah, not at all, not at all. Um, well, let's see, I will... Here we go. Um, so I'm Michelle Bowman, and uh, this is board fishing on the fly. Something a little different from your standard fly fishing, um, whether it's trout or uh, saltwater fishing, um, but it's something that I've gotten into and I love it a lot. And it's kind of my preferred method for, for fly fishing these days. So people, you know, always ask me when I say that I'm fly fish off my stand-up paddleboard. They kind of do a double take and they look at me like, wait, you do what? Um, and, you know, I, I fly fish off my stand-up paddleboard offshore, um, just in the local water here off South, Southern California. Um, but the reason why I do it is uh, it's easier to pump around a stand-up paddleboard um, than a kayak. Kayaks for me, I'm only five, six and, um, a kayak is big and clunky. It's hard to get on top of my car. Uh, and also these days with the inflatable stand-up paddle boards, I can actually travel with my paddle board. Um, gone down to Hawaii, I've gone to Hawaii, I've gone to um, mainland Mexico, the Yucatan. Um, so it's just easier to, to travel with. Um, do you, do so you find it's, uh, it's, so it's manageable to get that up on the top of your vehicle and down again on your own? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I have a, a Subaru Outback wagon and it's definitely easier. I'm not sure the actual weight of a paddleboard, um, but I know they're definitely lighter and more manageable than a kayak. So I have no problem getting it up um, on top of my car. Um, Better casting distance. I actually, that's compared to if you're sitting down in a kayak or sitting on a, 
a longboard surfboard. Um, when you uh, when you're casting, you actually you probably don't realize it if you're standing on the shore, but you actually get better distance when you can throw your your hips and your shoulders into it. So if you're just sitting down, you know, you take sort of the hips out of it, out of the picture. Um, but if you can kneel or if you can stand up, then it actually gives you another, you know, 20, 30 feet of uh, distance on your cast, which is, you know, essential. It's nice and quiet. Um, when you're out on the water, um, you can really sneak up on fish. I mean, I mean, obviously they can see you coming because you're a big board, but, you know, it's not like um, a motor on a boat. Uh, and the paddle, you, you're really just gliding along. So you can sneak up on fish. Uh, it's fantastic exercise. I mean, just getting out to where you're going to fish and coming back in and <laughs> getting out to the waves and coming back in um, is fantastic exercise. Uh, you can sight cast when you're standing up. You get a great pair of polarized sunglasses. You can see down into the water better while you're standing up as opposed to sitting down um, on a board or uh, in a kayak and it's just a lot of fun it's just something a little different um, and uh, it's just fun I love it so we'll jump into the kind of equipment you're going to use uh, of course first of all you're going to need to stand up paddle board or a long board I started out using just a foam long board the kind that you would learn how to surf on um, and then I transitioned once stand up paddle boards came along I realized, gosh, if I can stand up um, on the board, you know, it's it's much better than sitting down on the long board. Um, it's a lot more stable. Um, I can, you know, bring my equipment on and have a little bit more room. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you can stand up and get a little more distance on your casting and see better into the water. Michelle, I have, I have to say these these boards have become a lot wider since the back in the day when they started. That, that does that is that is that always a good thing to have a really wide board like that, or are there downsides to it? Well, you know, um, it kind of depends on your ability, um, you know, your balance. These days, they make stand up paddle boards that are specific for fishing because they know not everybody's a surfer, or, you know, skateboarder, or have great balance. So they make ones that are actually pretty wide. Um, I'll show you some pictures in a minute of ones that are, are really wide and they um, have very, they're very, very stable. Um, the only downside of that is if you're sitting down on it, um, it can almost be a little too wide to get your legs around. Um, the one that I use, the inflatable that I use is extremely wide. Um, and so I can actually barely kind of dangle my legs over because um, it's so wide. So I prefer one that's slightly more narrow, um, but you know, it just depends on your, on your ability. Okay. <clears throat> and then of course your paddle, you need a paddle. Um, there's all different kinds of paddles. The, the carbon fiber is what I prefer because it's nice and light. Um, so it's just a little less weight on your board. They make ones that are adjustable in size. If, you know, you're going to share it with um, somebody else, spouse, your kids, or whatever. Um, and then a crate or a backpack of some sort to carry your tackle, because uh, you just never know if uh, you're going in the water. And so you want to make sure that you have all your equipment um, as consolidated as possible. Um, we have uh, this bottom left photo is sort of a, a standard milk crate that's been converted into um, a product that some friends and I developed called a board fishing crate. And uh, it's got, you know, tie downs and you can throw all your gear in. It's got rod holders. It's got a little mesh top um, in case you do flip over all your stuff doesn't, you know, fall out. And if you have, you know, smaller fish, you can throw those in there too once you've caught them. Um, and one, day, one, day, one day Yeti will make one that costs like $900, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, on, on the subject of that, what, get, give us an idea of the approximate cost on um, boards. What sort of range are boards, we looking at? Well, you know, luckily these days, um, the paddle boards are, are getting a little less expensive. Um, you can go to Costco and you can get a paddle board. I think they're, you know, like 600 bucks. Um, 
And some of them, they'll, you know, you can get a package deal where it comes with the, the board and the paddle, because obviously if, if you're buying the board, they know that you need the paddle. So um, that goes all the way up to, there are some really expensive models that are, I think about $2,500. Um, and those get pretty fancy. They have, you know, some pedaling that you can do. Um, they have tie downs, they have, uh, a lot of different things, but there are ones that are modified for, like I said, just for fishing. Um, and you know, you get what you pay for. Um, the Costco ones might be good for starting out, but if you're going to be serious into board fishing, you know, you'll probably want to upgrade. Um, but there's also actually a pretty good used market on Craigslist and some of the the online used um, equipment. Um, websites that you can you know get something for anywhere from like six to eight hundred dollars and you know be set up pretty well to board fish so not too crazy and you know if you take care of your gear just like with anything it's gonna last a long time right um so another thing i also have brought along um is a cooler. I mean, you mentioned Yeti making a, a board fishing crate. There are, um, you know, boards that have uh, areas for a tie down where you can actually bring a cooler. I've, I've brought a cooler out before when we actually weren't fishing, but we were just taking the, the kids out to the kelp to snorkel and we put a, a Yeti cooler on the front, but you know, you never know how long you're going to be out there. Um, if you're going to be out all day, then you definitely going to want something to eat and to, you know, something to drink. So you could bring a, a little cooler along. And it also doubles as a seat. There are some um, stand-up paddle boards that have tie downs kind of slightly back from the center of the board that you can use as a seat to fish off of if you want to be more sitting down instead of just standing. So here's a bunch of different types of boards. The bottom left, that was the first uh, board that I started with. You can see it's just a, a foam stand-up paddle board or a foam um, surfboard. Uh, and it's got the old, you know, milk crate with the bungees on it. That's how I started. But you'll notice that the rod is just sitting there in, in the crate. And uh, so once you get flipped once in the surf and, and you have a yard sale in the ocean, all your fishing gear, you realize that that tactic doesn't work really well. So then if you look at the, the picture on the top left, that's when we um, created the board fishing crate that has the rod holders, uh, and something slightly more secure for your, your board um, and your, all your tackle to go on. And that would actually fit onto pretty much any board. And unfortunately, that company didn't really stick around for too long because everybody just got busy with other things in their lives. Um, Hobie has a crate that's almost the exact same type of thing um, that goes on a board. Uh, and that actually, they, it's a very substantial crate. So it's um, fantastic. And then you move over to the top right photo. Those are the more modern um, stand-up paddle boards that uh, I use for fishing. Uh, just offshore. And um, those are 11 and a half and 12 and a half feet long. So they're significantly bigger than a nine foot uh, surfboard, but uh, they're still very manageable in terms of, you know, getting on top of my car and everything. Um, and there you've got uh, the two different crates, crate systems that I, we had earlier from Board Fisher. And then the bottom one, that's the one that I travel with. That's an inflatable um, Hobie Sportsman. And unfortunately, they actually don't make those anymore. But there are other, uh, a lot of other different inflatable um, stand-up paddle boards that are out on the market now. And you can see this paddle board, it's a little bit shorter, but it's very wide. And it's got the inflatable pontoons on the side. Makes it very, very stable platform. Um, I could actually walk around on this while I'm fighting fish. Um, I can very comfortably turn around um, and cast, you know, behind me. Um, so the, the ones that are made for, for fishing these days are actually extremely stable. 
It's great. It's good to know you can get those tarpon right off of uh, San Diego too. The, <laughs> right, the, well, the, war, the warm water coming up. That's from down the Yucatan, obviously. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, that was that's my travel board. Um, and people sort of wonder about you know inflatable craft and sharp hooks and and that type of thing. And um, the the material that the inflatables are made out of is very very um, rigid. Uh, so I, I mean, unless you're gonna, you know, try and pop a hole in it, I'm not too worried about uh, you know a fly or something dragging along the side of it. Um, I, I I'm thinking, you know, when people get into float tubing, they get into all the accessories you can think of. And uh, I, do you ever consider having a depth finder there, or does it not really apply to your kind of fishing? You know, I don't really because one, it would it's just a little bit more weight. You know, and um, I the way that I fish, I, I sort of I fish more off the surface um, because I'm fly fishing. You know, if I if I was conventional fishing, you know, I guess you could do that, but I I prefer just to, to sort of use my my knowledge of uh, the surrounding area and my knowledge of the fish um, and more physical things that I'm seeing on the surface of the water or quite honestly I, I brought a snorkel with me if I don't um, snorkel and mask if I don't know um, what the what what it's like underneath me and I'll just stick my head in <laughs> and look <you> know? <laughs> because just like with any fishing you're looking for structure and seeing where the fish are um, so I guess it's the old school depth finders mask and a snorkel <laughs> great excellent um, uh, let's do this on. Oh, you know what? One thing I did want to mention um, is, okay, when you're on a board, um, obviously staying on top of the board is ideal, what, you're, what you want to be doing. Um, but there are times when you might fall off, you know, whether you, some, the wake of a boat comes by or you're fighting a fish, or whatever, you fall off. Um, so the easiest ways, there's two ways to get on back onto the board. Um, of course, you want to flip the board over if it's Inside side up, flip it over. Um, and you can either go from the back of the board and kind of crawl up the back from the tail end. Um, or you can um, go to the middle of the board and sort of grab the other side and haul yourself up um, on your chest and your belly and then swing your feet over. The, neither of those methods makes you look really cool. That, that, is, for, <laughs> that is a certainty. Well, the fact that you've fallen in already, you know, you're sort of working, working on just getting back to being on the board. So, so do you do you use a tether as well, just to keep you and the board connected? Yes, yeah, that's one of the safety equipments I highly recommend. Um, is a leash, um, that that and PFD, of course, uh, is is very important. And I think in California, United States, it's actually the law that you have to have some sort of personal flotation device uh, when you're using a stand-up paddleboard outside of um, a surf, you know, situation. So, um, so yes, uh, having a leash is a great idea. You just never know if the wind's going to pick up um, or, uh, you know, waves are going to take your board or whatever. So having a leash is, is a really good idea, especially if you're not that experienced, but then you, you definitely need to have a leash. Great. So some of the other equipment um, we're going to get into for saltwater fly fishing, I use a seven to 10 weight. Um, that'll handle pretty much anything you're going to encounter out in the ocean, um, kind of depending on where you are. You know, there are some days that I, I, will, I will go specifically just to hit calico um, and other days where I'm looking for something bigger, you know, a yellowtail or white sea bass or something. Um, then I'll bring something a little heavier. Um, and the nice thing is there, some of the rods these days are great. They're nice and lightweight. So you can actually be out there um, and be casting all day and, and not get really tired. And then, you know, you can board fish on freshwater. So a four to eight weight is great. Um, the one good thing uh, in terms of reels that I recommend uh, is to make sure that you have a really good drag um, when you're out on the salt water. Because if you do hook into a bigger fish, um, you don't, you know, it, the only sort of 
recourse you have against this fish is, is your weight um, and, and your drag. Because you're on a board, it's basically just gonna pull you to wherever it wants to go for the most part. Um, so having a good drag is gonna be essential to, to fighting that fish. Um, fishing line, I prefer a sinking line. Um, even though a lot of the fish that I'm going after are um, you know, slightly below the surface um, or on the surface, you know, if you, I, I look for bait plucking on the surface. Um, I do like a sinking line because I am fishing um, most of the time in kelp and I know that the, the calico and a lot of the fish are slightly below the surface. So I'll, I'll fish like 150 to 400 um, uh, weight sinking line um, and, uh, and that seems to cover everything I need. More of the, the four or the 150 to like 250 is probably standard. I'm going for something. Whatever you use for your surf fishing would work just fine. I mean, on the lighter side. So it would. Although I, some people I know actually use a floating line for, for surf fishing. Um, mm -hmm. But I prefer something that's going to sink because I, I know a lot of the fish um, are, are often slightly down deeper in the water. Um, and I mean, I'm not going for halibut or anything. I mean, because that's, you know, bottom fish. Uh, and I'm out in the kelp. So. Um, but we're we're talking more, you know, your calico and your surface. Um, Bonita, Bonita is great out there. But I'll get into that type of fish, uh, all the different types of fish later. Um, other fishing gear, of course, a buddy. I highly recommend that you you go with somebody else because you just never know. Being out in the ocean by yourself um, is not a great idea, uh, especially if you're just starting out. It's always good to have somebody out there with you. Plus, you know, that way they can take pictures of you while you're fighting your fish, and that kind of thing. Um, needle nose pliers to get, you know, hooks out of fish, that kind of thing. Uh, a gaff, if you're gonna go out for bigger fish, then a gaff is a really good thing to have because, you know, uh, it's harder to get a, a bigger fish on your board. So that's, um, that's something that I'll, I'll bring sometimes, not, not every time, but if I'm going to an area like uh, La Jolla kelp where I know there's a lot of big fish, then I'll, I'll bring my gaff. Um, and an anchor, a pole, or a drift sock. Um, if you're in slightly shallower water board fishing, like in the flats, let's say like in South San Diego Bay, um, then you can use like an anchor or a pole to sort of stake up. Um, if you're in a, a good area, so you don't have to drift. Um, or there's a drift sock, which are made for kayaks, and they, uh, they'll they help slow you down if you're, you know, if the wind picks up and you're getting blown, or there's an area where you want to kind of hang out a little bit more, um, and you, the current or the wind is going to carry you away. Um, another thing that I use actually as an anchor when I'm out in the kelp is the kelp itself. I'll get along the edge of the kelp, and I'll take some kelp and I'll just throw it on the, uh, across the tail of my board and it'll just sort of hold me there so that I can fish along that, that outside edge. Um, a knife, knife is always a good thing to have out in the water. You just uh, never know when you're gonna need to cut yourself loose from you know, kelp, you get tangled in kelp or your, your gear gets tangled in kelp um, or if you know there's something that, like a fish that you need to gut right away that's always a good thing to have out there. And then of course the GoPro or some sort of waterproof camera to, to record all of those glorious fishing moments. You know what else looks good from your bottom right photo is that you, your line just piles up naturally on the front of the board there. So you're not, unlike kayaks, there's nothing really to get to hung up on. It looks right. like a, a real advantage there. Right, right. That's one thing people have asked me actually is whether, you know, I have some sort of stripping basket. And I, I actually don't. And I'm a little bit more of a minimalist when it comes to board fishing. Um, you know, some of the, the boards um, allow you to bring all sorts of gear with you that almost make it a little bit more like a kayak. But for me, you know, as a, a fly fishing angler, I want less on the, the deck of my board because it's less to hang up on. So, you know, I don't bring a ton of rods. Um, I have, you know, my fishing crate on the front and the rest of my tackle will be uh, in a backpack. I just don't want too much stuff exactly for the, for the line to hook up on. 
So, all right, let's see. There we go. And of course, safety. Safety is of the utmost importance. Um, good polarized sunglasses, a hat and buff for, you know, keeping the sun off you. Um, that's really important. Um, of course, good polarized sunglasses will also help you see fish and see into the water. Um, good waterproof sunblock, uh, and don't forget to reapply it because it only usually lasts about 90 minutes. Um, a whistle is also a very good thing to have because I've been out there when, you know, a fog bank will roll in. Um, and if there's boats, potentially boats around, um, you want to make sure that they can hear you. So um, a whistle is great. Uh, a light, if you're going out in early, early morning hours, maybe before the sun comes up, or if you happen to stay out late, it's good to have a light. There is actually a light that um, is made for kayakers that fits in a, uh, in a rod holder. And it's got a, a red light, a green light, and a white light. And that's um, a great safety light to have in case you, uh, you get stuck out there. Oops. Um, a VHF radio. I actually uh, also have a waterproof floating VHF radio that I take with me. I've uh, had a couple run-ins with some of the party boats and, um, you know, have had the need, at least before I had a radio, and that's why I got a radio, because I, I found that I might, I might need a little help from either other boaters or, you know, the lifeguard or coast guard. Um, but for safety purposes, it's good to have. And then again, the two last things, a PFD, personal flotation device, and a leash are essential. Um, if you happen to fall off the board, you just never know what your situation is going to be. Um, the PFDs, there are some great, um, they're sort of horse, uh, horseshoe-shaped collars that go around, so they're very low profile. They allow you to cast very easily, and uh, you know they're not those big, gigantic, orange, bulky ones that they that are on boats and stuff. So I highly recommend uh, the last two. Um, let's see. Oops. All right, so saltwater flies, you know, your standard little bait fish patterns. Um, this one up here on the top left um, is a great basic pattern. Uh, this one actually on the, the bottom right, um, that was given to me, I think Al Q might have actually given that to me um, when it looked a little bit more like the one on the top left, but the more it got beat up, actually the better, you know, it caught fish. Because if you think of uh, predatory fish, they often go after the little weak bait fish that can't, you know, hang with the stool. Uh, so the more it got to look all beat up like that one on the bottom right, um, it actually, I think I used it until the hook just rusted out and finally broke, but it was a fantastic fly. Uh, and then, you know, shrimp flies, because there are shrimp that hang out in the kelp. So I, I recommend shrimp flies. And then the bottom left, these bend backs, those are great because you can sort of throw them over the kelp and drag them across because calico will, you know, look up and, and see those tootling across the top of the kelp and, uh, and they'll come up and, and slam them. They're great. Um, and then also, Gosh, poppers, poppers work great. I mean, if you think about it when you're out there on the kelp and you, you hear bait popping all over the place, you know, that attracts fish attention. Um, other little crab patterns. Um, oops, sorry, keep hitting my. Um, this is a great little shaker shrimp that we have um, that has a little shaker in the body and uh, that attracts, you know, attracts fish as well. So there's, there's just a lot of crease flies. Those work. Um, I got a question um, just kept popped up right now, an interesting one. Do you, do you use any uh, weed guards just to stay clear in the kelp or do you not find that necessary? Um, you can, yeah. I mean, I generally don't fish right on top of the kelp. I usually try and fish um, right along the edge of the kelp just because um, it's harder to get the fish out of the kelp. 
Um, so if I do, yeah, I have used um, flies with weed guards, definitely. Um, but I ideally I'm I'm fishing the outside edge, um, or like I'll show you a photo later. There's like little alleys through kelp beds, and I'll try and fish that just because as soon as they hit it, you know, then they're going down into the kelp, and then you're stuck trying to get it out. Um, but the uh, but definitely weed guards will work for sure. All right. Um, so then, of course, there's the question, do you sit, stand, or kneel? And this is sort of a personal preference, you know, on your ability. Um, I started out, like, the bottom left photo is, uh, I was actually on the East Coast in Block Island and didn't have a stand-up paddleboard, so I just went out on a longboard, so I'm sitting, um, just because it's, you know, too wobbly to kneel or stand. Um, but you can kneel or stand to to fight a fish or to cast. Again, as I mentioned before, when you're casting to get a little bit more distance, kneeling and standing is preferable because you can really get a little bit more uh, umph into your cast and, and get you know, 20 or 30 feet more distance. Um, and also you can see better into the water um, and farther uh, out on the water. So it's, it's kind of a, a preference personal preference. And so I we notice we notice a, a broad range of clothing options in these uh, in, in the, these slides. So I mean, are there occasions when you would want to have a full wetsuit? Um, I mean, I know you're you probably not going out in the dead of winter, but when right. when would that be an appropriate choice? Yeah, well, you can definitely I mean, for sun protection, you can use a full wetsuit or, you know, for for just cold protection, you can use a full wetsuit. I generally tend to fish in sort of the summer fall um, when it's warmer and the mornings are a little bit more calm um, and there's the waves are smaller. The winter time, I don't board fish as much um, just because, well, one, it's a lot colder um, and it, the sun is actually not up in the morning when I usually fish um, as early uh, and the waves are bigger. And so then I'll just go surfing because <laughs> I surf too. So, um, but you could definitely wear a full wetsuit um, and booties if you wanted to, you know, to protect your feet from cold or if you have to walk over rocks or anything. Um, so uh, I would, I would definitely wear um, a wetsuit or, you know, surf trunks in the summertime or, you know, bathing suit um, over waders. I don't suggest that you, you wear waders um, when you're board fishing because if you happen to fall in, you know, they'll definitely obviously fill up with water and that's very difficult to get back on your board when you're basically lugging however many pounds of water with you to try and get back up on your board. So. I would wear something that's um, much more snug to your body that's not going to fill up with water like that. So wetsuit, bathing suit, surf trunks. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then often to fight a fish, I will, um, if it's, you know, big enough or strong enough, I'll sit down. Um, not only just because uh, I have better, you know, balance with the lower center of gravity when you're sitting, but like in this picture, which was uh, taken down in Yucatan, um, in the mangroves, I was fighting this tarpon and the tarpon is, you know, trying to drag me back, or head back into the mangroves. So I actually sat down on my board and you can see I'm using my feet to actually backpedal my board away from the mangroves, um, sort of my own little outboard motor. But uh, I use my feet to, to sort of act as an anchor and help paddle me backwards. Um, wasn't until later that the guys on the boat who um, took us out there told me that there's caiman. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have been so eager to put my feet in the water, but. Uh, but I imagine, imagine you're able to use stealth to sneak into those spots that boats can't get into. So there's- For sure. Other. Yeah, that's definitely one of the benefits of, of a paddleboard is you can, you can sneak into some of these tiny little nooks and crannies and mangroves that uh, that house, you know, some of these baby tarpon, and there'll just be, you know, dozens of them sitting there because they they all heard the boat coming, 
And then I get off the boat and I slide in there on my paddle board and they're all just sitting right there. And yeah, it's fantastic. All right. Um, so specific to board fishing, and you know, this also is, um, you could probably also apply these to, to kayaking as well. Um, winds and currents are not your friend. Um, well, they can be your friend. You just have to know um, how to use them to your benefit. I suggest you always, before you paddle out, you look at the weather, see what the winds are going to be like, see what the tides are going to be like, so you know if it's an extreme tide, there's going to be a lot more current moving while you're out there, and plan your drifts. Um, as the wind comes up, you know, you're going to want to make sure that you're not way out someplace by yourself and you're going to get more blown out to sea because as you're paddling, um, as you're standing up, you're basically a big sail. Your body acts as a sail. Uh, so you want to, you're going to get caught and you're going to get blown. So if there's an area that on a kelp bed that you know you're going to want to, um, you know, drift along a particular area, make sure you plan your drift based on, on the winds and make sure that you're not going to be out there, you know, if it turns out the winds are going to pick up and be 15 miles an hour offshore, because then, then that'll be a little bit of a problem. You can always lay down um, or sit um, and sort of almost paddle your board like a kayak if you kind of get into trouble. So that way you're just a little bit less of you, you know, acting as a sail. Um, casting, plan your drift. Um, I suggest uh, when you sort of the same type of ideas when you're along uh, the outside of a kelp bed or whatever little reef you're at, um, plan your drift so that you know you're going to try and paddle along the outside edge, not you know go straight into the kelp because that definitely is a, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, you can turn around, like I said, some of these boards are very stable, so you you know don't forget there's always stuff behind you. Um, a couple of times, you know, I'll be casting in front of me and then I'll hear bait, you know, splashing behind me. So back casting is a, a really good thing to, to remember you can do because all you have to do is just back cast and then turn around and, you know, catch the fish that way. Uh, and bend your knees. Bending your knees is really specific to board fishing if you're standing up because that's going to be sort of your, um, uh, help it's going to help you balance and that's if you stand straight up you're more apt to, to tipping over so bend your knees that's going to be sort of your shock absorbers to not only just your balance but to the motion of the ocean um sea anchors as i mentioned before um you don't want to take too big of an anchor with you obviously because you're on a paddle board uh, but if you're on a flats or something um you can take you know like a, a little pound weight or something um, on a rope, tie that off to your leash plug um, and, and throw that in the water to just sort of help you uh, stay in one little place if the winds do pick up. Same with a, a push pole, you know, that you would use on a flats boat. You can bring one of those with you or, um, oh, right. So that's a small anchor. And then the sea anchor, that's the, the drifting um, sock. Um, and then paddling out, and in of the waves, that's often the most tricky part um, to honestly to board fishing. Um, you wanna make sure you secure your gear. And this, I mentioned this earlier, there's nothing worse than a yard sale with all of your, all of your gear going in the water. Um, so really make sure when you paddle out that it's all you know, battened down. And when you come back in, put all your gear back in your backpack, put it in your crate, whatever. Um, and I suggest also, um, laying your rods down. If you, if you can secure them um, flat on your board, that's a good idea. I can't tell you how many times I've seen kayakers coming in and they've got, you know, their six rods in their, in their crate or whatever, and their rod holders all sticking straight up and then they get into two feet of water and their kayak flips over and, you know, they pop it back over and either the rods are gone or they're, they're broken because you're in two feet of water. You've got to you know, eight foot rod. So definitely secure your gear. And this is sort of putting it all together. So here, you know, you can see I've got a little bend in my knees. I've got the, 
There's a, a bit of wind and current. So you can see I've got my push pole staked up in the, in the sand, tied off to my leash plug, and it's holding me in place. I'm casting to those uh, rolling baby tarpon. Seasons, um, it's sort of water and uh, wave, wind and wave dependent. As I mentioned, I prefer um, being out in the ocean summer and fall, but I will board fish um, in the bays and lagoons uh, in the spring and winter or when the water's, you know, where the water's a little quieter um, and there's, there's not as many boaters on the water um, in the spring and winter. Uh, and, you know, Mission Bay is a ton of fun in the winter time. And, uh, and actually the, the Back Bay in San Diego Bay, you know, we all know that there's some bonefish um, and actually the marinas up in, um, you know, the LA Orange County areas, there's tons of marinas. Um, those are great places to actually go board fishing. So I highly recommend um, some of the, the marinas, the fish like to hide out underneath the, the boats that are there. Um, going back, going back to your last slide, Michelle, on the, um, you know, you're obviously in the the Yucatan, and you've got your inflatable. Um, do do you find that there's good rental rental board possibilities, and uh, is that an, an an increasing thing now? Definitely, most definitely. Um, a lot of places, you know, ten years ago, had never heard of stand up paddle boards, and they were just too hard to get them, um, but. What I've noticed recently is a lot of places have them, um, maybe not for fishing, but just for you know people to recreate on. So you could very easily just you know take your rod out uh, with you and um, and and use one of their paddle boards. Uh, of course, if you go to Hawaii, there's tons of paddle boards to rent there. Um, there's some great flats there that would be fantastic for board fishing. Does that does that inf does that inflatable become about the size of a suitcase when you're done? It does. The inflatables are are great because they not only do they pack down to the size of the suitcase. Um, a lot of the manufacturers makes them so that they weigh under fifty pounds, so you're not paying um, an excessive weight charge. You know, if you're if you're going to fly with it, um, and it will come with a a uh, paddle that breaks down into a couple pieces and it all fits into one bag. And like one that I have, it actually the bag has backpack straps on it. So, you know, it's meant to travel with and technically hike, but you know, I don't, I don't hike much with mine. <laughs> yeah, excellent. If you were, if you were gonna go up to, you know, like in the Eastern Sierra or something and go up to some of the lakes up there, um, you could do that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there definitely are many more places and resorts that have, uh, that have paddle boards now. Good. Let's see. Um, so the spots that I fish, so um, I prefer, you know, the kelp beds. So this top left, that's actually <laughs> the birch aquarium, their no, they're kelp exhibit, but you know, if you're not familiar with kelp, that's that's what you're looking at. So it's very vertical, um, and the fish hang out actually in in the fronds of the kelp, um, and the, the calico will actually sit on the fronds and and just wait for something to swim by, and they'll they'll ambush something. Um, but then you also have you know bonita and white sea bass um, and barracuda that are swimming in there um, as well. So there's there's a huge variety of fish you can catch. Um, the top right, that's actually over here. This is actually flying out of San Diego. That's Point Loma kelp. You can see that right there, the brown patches. So you're not too far offshore, which is the nice thing. I mean, quarter mile, maybe a half mile, but you're, you're not super far offshore. Um, down here, this is, um, Actually, this is the Port of Los Angeles right here. So, uh, my gosh, I'm drawing a blank now um, what that area is called, but this is just right outside the, the Port of uh, Los Angeles. Some great kelp there. And then, you know, I've just gone on, um, on Google Maps, actually, to kind of look and see um, some areas that have kelp. This is right off uh, Newport on this bottom left. 
and you can see kind of get an idea of some access points and parking and that type of thing. And, you know, I, I mentioned the kelps and the little alleys in the kelp and, and fishing along the edge of the kelp. So this is kind of what I'm looking for, the center picture when I get to a kelp bed, um, because the fish will sit right along these edges right here, and they'll be looking for schools of bait um, that are swimming through these little alleys. So if I throw my fly out here, you know, wait 10 seconds, let it sink, and then strip it right through here, something's gonna see it and just boom, ambush it and, and hit it. So that's what I'm looking for um, on the outside edges, outside edges or inside. Actually, if you take a look at this um, picture of the Point Loma kelp, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. There's these little, little alleyways that you can spot when you're paddling around them. And that's what you want to look for. And once again, you've got much greater mobility than most other crafts and, you know, stealth and... For sure, for sure. You know. And if you see, you know, a big open patch right in the middle, you know, you can take your paddleboard and cruise right over that and, and get into that. Whereas, you know, a boat, boater's not going to want to take his, his boat through there because his motor's going to get all fouled and everything. Um, so that's just another benefit of being on the paddleboard. Um, and then, of course, rocky reefs. Um, this is my local surf spot, Swami's, which is unfortunately actually now an MPA, so I can't fish there. But that used to be one of my favorite places to fish. Um, but if you check out areas um, at a low tide, see what the structure is like down below, then come back um, at a higher tide, then you, know, you can access areas that you wouldn't be able to access if you were surf fishing. Um, so this, that's one good thing to look for. And then, as I mentioned, the basin lagoons, um, marinas, anchorages are, are great places to fish. Um, there's often a lot of fish hanging out in there because they're nice little places to hide for the fish. Um, and then, if you're traveling, you know, mangroves. Here's a great example of, you know, there's no boat that can really go in that in that water. I mean, you could, I guess, at higher tide. But uh, this is, you know, like a foot and a half of water right here. So it's a nice little area that you can sneak into and sneak into some of these little canals that are in the mangroves. Just bring your uh, mosquito repellent. <laughs> There's some voracious mosquitoes in these areas. Um, again, open ocean, one of my favorites, um, and the flats outside the mangroves. Um, fish. And then types of fish, you know, pretty much anything you're going to catch on conventional gear, you can catch on the fly. I mean, except for maybe halibut because they're deeper bottom fish, but um, these are all caught board fishing. So bonita, yellowtail, um, calico, again, baby tarpon. Um, you can catch anything, just have, have the right gear. Uh, there's a halibut. So that I actually caught um, going in. I was just kind of messing around and I was trolling on my way in. <laughs> and I caught this calico, or this, uh, this halibut here. Um, also this little grumpy rockfish. Um, this is down in Mexico, uh, Rancho Leonero, that little pompano or Mexican look down, I think it's called. Uh, and then barracuda. Barracuda are super, super fun on the fly when you're out there. And of course, that's a smaller one. Some of the bigger ones are uh, also awesome to catch. And then there's the really big fish. So this is um, the biggest fish I've caught off my board. I actually caught this on conventional gear, um, but it's a, you know, it was a 40 pound white sea bass. And um, those are out there and you definitely can catch them on your board um, on the fly or conventional. This is another time when it's good to you know, oh, here you can see I'm, I'm wearing my radio right there. Um, because this fish actually took me and uh, it was towing me. I had my feet in the water to sort of help, you know, drag my board a little bit to slow it down. But it was heading west of Hawaii. And uh, my friends that I was out there with, they said that there was actually a weight behind my board, that it was, it was towing me so fast. But then it turned around and headed to the kelp, and I, I knew I had to, to crank it in and, and get it in, because if it got into the kelp, then um, 
that was going to be much more difficult to get it up. So obviously, I won this battle, um, and it was delicious on my barbecue, mostly casual for these, but <laughs> yeah, of, of course, this is um, prompted a question immediately of, but which area did you catch this white sea bass in, and ah. how far out were you? And you don't have to disclose any secret information that's not part of your deal. That's okay. Um, this was actually out in La Jolla, in La Jolla Tel, um, and uh, I found, you know, there at getting there and sort of the pre-dawn hours, I'd paddle out in the dark with my friends. Um, again, this is the instance that I would use my um, my light, um, my little beacon and my rod holder, because as you can see, there are other boats out there. And uh, get out there in the pre-dawn hours um, and, and fish super early before all the party boats get there. <laughs> um, because once I, the party I, boats get there, it's, it's a whole different you know dynamic. But, I have to ask you, have, you, have you ever been tempted to fish in your husband's chum line when he's setting that chum line for the Makos? You know, we've talked about it. And I think one of these days I would like to. I mean, the one nice thing about doing that is, um, is that I can, I can sight cast to the Mako, you know, that I would want. So obviously I'll let the, the 100 pounder and probably even the 80 pounder um, swim by, but I can go for like a, a 20 or 30 pounder. That would be <laughs> a lot of fun. Knowing that he had my back in the boat, he could always come pick me up wherever I end up. Um, we, we've talked about it and I don't know, maybe once the kids are a little older. <laughs> it would make a great video, that's for sure. Uh, it certainly would. Mm. Yeah, stay tuned on my Instagram. I'll post that if we go live with that someday. <laughs> um, but actually Conway has caught one. Um, he's caught a blue shark off a stand-up paddle board. So it, it has been done, but just not by me yet. Um, so that's kind of it for my board fishing. Um, I will answer any questions. I, I think there are some, looks like in the chat. And uh, yeah, I hope, I hope that, uh, if you want to board fish, you know, if you need some pointers, let me know. I don't actually guide for board fishing because um, it would be sort of a long process to teach you how to stand up paddle board first and then get out um, fishing. But, uh, but if you already know how to, to paddle board um, and you feel confident with your, with your skills on a paddle board, then, you know, then we can talk. So you could start out by renting a board and then just getting taking your milk crate with you and get baby steps into it, right? right. Exactly. Uh, exactly. I've got a few. I've got a few pretty good questions here. Um, I'll right. start with the latest ones. It's easier. Um, Jim Bixby's asking: Have you ever been threatened or harassed by power boaters, or are you able to kind of coexist with those guys pretty well? Well, it's funny. Uh, the reason why I got a VHF radio is because um, I've been hassled a couple times by some of the party boats um, where I'll be, you know, because I get out on the water before they're there, I have gotten them to, you know, some of the little hot spots that they want. And they'll come and literally like pull up within 20 or 30 yards of me and be sitting right there. Um, and next thing I know, there's, you know, irons that are flying in my direction. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's, that's why I have a VHF radio. Right. Um, but the, the best encounter actually I ever had was, um, was with um, a boat, uh, two guys in a boat. It was kind of a foggy morning and I was um, out uh, off Swami's before it was an MPA. And, you know, when it's super quiet and, um, there's no other noise. You can hear water. You can hear on the water very far away. And so I heard these these guys come up and they're kind of motoring and I hear, oh, you know, what, what is that over there? And, oh, it's, you know, some guy, you know, fishing off his board. And then I hear, no, oh, that's a girl. <laughs> and she's fly fishing. Um, that was that was my best interaction. That was a lot of fun. But double double whammy, girl and fly fishing. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So Jim's also um, talking about Point Loma. Do you launch a Shelter Island or is there anywhere closer? It's just yeah, Point Loma, you would have to 
what I would recommend is actually if you have someone who can drop you off, you know, if you have somebody who's going to fish, then maybe throw your board in there um, and head out there, you know, or you could, of course, you could definitely um, paddle out from inside the bay, just slightly longer, you know, a little bit more exercise. Um, but yeah, you can definitely launch from inside the bay. Um, but uh, I, I see if I can hook a ride always, always and, and hop on a boat and then toss my board over and, and all my gear and, and fish while they're in the boat. So. Great, we got one another question from Benjamin about, do you, do you have experience um, of this, of board fishing in Alamitos Bay or down Long Beach area? Cause that's, you know, yeah. very, very popular with, with surf fishermen and Right. You know, I don't. Um, I haven't. I haven't fished up there um, off my board, and because I'm in San Diego, um, I'm mostly just off of either Encinitas or La Jolla. Those are my my little favorite spots. So unfortunately, I don't have any great tips on, on where to go up there. Um, I highly recommend hopping on on Google and uh and seeing you know what's available in terms of kelp and, and structure uh, i would i would have thought that you know catalina on the on the the, the oh, near side yeah, of catalina yeah. would be great because yes. you know there's going to be a few boats around but it's you know the, the best kelp in the world for mm -hmm. di divers say it's the best forest in the, yes. in the world, yeah right? i actually yeah. have those there um, that would be a great spot. Um, I don't know what sort of um, reserves are, are out there. That's the one thing, you know, that's the only thing about, you know, if you don't have, um, you know, a fish finder or anything, is you need to sort of know ahead of time um, where your, your marine reserves are going to be. That's yes. the key part with La Jolla, um, is that there's, you know, the marine reserves are sort of spotty. So you really have to make sure you, you know where you're going ahead of time. So I noticed know. driving south, like right by the San, San Onofre power plant, there's just huge yep. kelp right. bed, beds around there. I'm always looking at them longingly as I'm on the road. And <laughs> Funny, so oh am I. <laughs> imagine that's pretty good too. Yes, yes. I know, you know, I, I know people who have fished off there. Um, I've never board fished off there, but I have, I have talked to many friends about uh, about doing that. One of these days, I'll, I'll get up there. But yeah, there's some nice thick kelp, and you know we've had um, some pretty warm winters lately. So a lot of the kelp is is not as thick as it used to be. You know, five six years ago. Um, but this winter, I don't know. I feel like we've had some pretty cold water. So uh, so maybe some of that kelp has has come back and, and gotten a little thicker. Um, I, ju I just visited the uh, California Science Center um, down by USC, and I'd, I had no idea, but they have a, um, a full-on kelp forest tank. Oh, nice. in, it, in it, they have every local species yeah. Yeah. that there is. I mean, including black sea bass and all the, you know, the, for the forbidden species. Yeah. And it's great. You can just sit and watch these fish relating to the kelp. Mm -hmm. all the time you know yeah. the, the tiny ones feet it shows the the, the 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 role that kelp plays in in marine life how how essential it is right and, yeah uh, that's actually a great idea because you you really get an idea of you know how the calico actually like hunker down in the kelp and and sort of look out into those channels as i was talking about because they're gonna ambush something that's that's cruising by so I've got another um, question from Cece here. Uh, Corbina, you know, they're traditionally you would something surf you, you would surf fish for those, right. and someone suggesting maybe get out a little bit and then cast into the shore. Would that not really be workable? It would be. Well, if the if the waves were small, um, then you could definitely do that. That the only thing that would be tough, of course, is you know. If you're pointing towards the shore, then you're back. You're, you're not aware of what's coming behind you. And that's when you know you have sneaker sets and waves um, that can that can wipe you out. Um, so that would be the only drawback. I mean, if it's if it's super small or completely flat or you're in a you know a bay, then by all means I I would I would try that for sure. Um, 
especially, you know, uh, these days, the grunion were just running, I believe this last week, um, and a lot of fish, um, a lot of bigger fish uh, will come in tight as they're chasing, you know, following the grunion in. So if you get a nice small day um, or in a bay or something where the grunion had run, then that's probably a, a pretty good tactic. You wouldn't have to go all that far out. Well, you've got, I mean, a two foot wave can wipe you out, can't it? If you're, oh, not, yeah. re if you're oh, not ready for it. I mean, it's I, my experience on those boards is that even, even a like, even a one foot wave, if you've not got your balance correctly, I mean, right. that, right. that can take you out. So you're looking for those calm days, clearly. Right. Exactly. I mean, that's why if you notice all of my photos are, are on pretty calm days. And that's another reason why I go out first thing in the morning. Um, before the winds pick up, uh, because the less chop um, there is in the water, then it's just it's just easier to fish. Have you done Have you done much uh, fresh water, like on the local lakes or anything? Um, I haven't done a ton, but I have some. You know, um, you can take uh, your stand up paddleboard out at Lake Hodges locally, and I, I know this guy who works there. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> so um, if I ever get in trouble, I can just call him and he'll come get me. Um, but, uh, but, you know, definitely lakes for bass, that's um, definitely a possibility or trout. You can, that, I mean, then you don't really have to worry about waves unless you're talking about other boaters and jet skiers and stuff. Um, but that lakes, I highly recommend lakes. And I've thought about taking that to the Eastern Sierra and, you know, instead of a, um, a drift tube or anything, just throw my board in, but I don't know. I haven't, I haven't done that quite yet. <laughs> well, um, anywhere you can, anywhere you can float to, you can board. Um, like, yeah, uh, I would have like thought the lo yeah, local bass lakes in, um, mm -hmm. in, uh, you know, spring when the, the fish are up shallow, it'd be great. Right. But, right. But you have to check the regulations because some, um, some lakes will allow, um, boats, but they won't allow uh, other personal watercraft. Yeah, like Lake Casitas, you couldn't do it, but you could probably do it in Castaic, for instance. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, so just check your, you know, your local regulations first. Right. Um, great. Let's see. Someone saying um, Carpinteria would be a good place. Quiet beach with mellow waves. That's uh, another. Not I mean, I would have thought all the way up to Santa Barbara. There's lots of lots of possibilities. Oh yeah. I mean, anywhere. I mean, you can fish anywhere where you know the waves are are not going to be real big and it's not too windy. So it's just a matter of, of the conditions on any on any given day. Really. Right. Well, I think I think we've just about run out of questions. I want to remind everybody to log on to the. Um, Southwest Council site, all you have to do is donate $5 or more and you will be eligible for the drawing. Um, I want to thank Michelle immensely for doing this show, doing this show this week. And um, next week we have her husband Conway. And then two weeks after that, we, we have Graham Day and it's all gonna be covering very similar approachable accessible waters, all using different types of craft. So um, there's no more questions. I think, uh, okay, great, pre yes, I'm getting lots of good thanks and thank thanks you. Thanks everybody, I appreciate it. All thank that. you, Jeff. thank you very much, Michelle. Oh, somebody, somebody asked around Makos. Uh, I did get um, I did get buzzed by a Mako once <laughs> when, I, <laughs> when I was out fishing. Um, Luckily, he was just checking me out, and uh, I did not throw uh, a line at him, but uh, just let him swim off. But yes, good there for you. Good for you. Yeah. All and right. If anybody has any other questions, you can hit me up um, on Instagram. So there you go. All right. Thank. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.